Hi, everyone, and welcome to the session titled Rolling with the Selections, How to Make the Best of EBA Usage Data Long Term. My name is Ariel Lomnes, and I am the Interim Associate Chief Librarian for Research and Collections at the University of British Columbia's Okanagan campus. I also want to acknowledge the contributions to this project by others as well, including my colleague Ellen George and two other librarians, Milan Simic and Tristan Carter, who worked on this project as co-op students earlier this year. Both are now working at the noted institutions on the slide. UBC, for anybody that isn't already aware of where we're located, uh, is a doctorate-granting research-focused public institution located on the campuses in both Vancouver and Kelowna in British Columbia, Canada. Between our two campuses, we have a combined student population of well over 72,000, and we serve an immensely diverse student and faculty population. Next, I'll give a little bit of background to the EBA work at UBC and how this project came to be. So at UBC, we started uh, direct EBAs with Cambridge, Taylor and Francis, which includes CRC Press, as well as Wiley back in September, 2015. Then in September, 2022, our Wiley agreement flipped to a front list only as we were able to purchase the remainder of the backlist that had already not been purchased through other means. A lot of it we had already owned through past uh, package purchases as well. And as it stands right now, um, we can't do the same with Cambridge and TNF, so we will be continuing EBAs with both of those. Um, for our EBA uh, title selection process, which sort of sets the stage to this presentation, it does look a little bit different from other institutions. And um, the reason being is that we don't focus purely on high use titles. We are aware that a few other schools do the same, but it isn't quite the norm, um, nor the way that most publishers suggest that those selections should take place. So throughout the year, uh, our subject librarians submit their recommendations through folders in Gobi, and they also tag any faculty, student, or course requests that come in. This helps to balance the high use selections that we also make um, with others that fit within our collection development goals and aims to help to collect, you know, underrepresented topics such as those that are associated with smaller user groups on the campuses that may not meet high use thresholds. The remaining selections are typically achieved by working from the highest used titles downwards, with some consideration to the publication year of the content, whether it is a reprint or not, whether the title is already open access, and uh, to ensure diversity amongst all of the subject areas that we cover at UBC. And additionally, we do typically place a cap of around $350 simply to review anything above that separately and individually, as some may be a multi-volume work, or they may simply be very expensive textbooks that aren't suitable for the collections funds we utilize for the EBAs. So why does this matter to us enough to want to dig into data around it? So while generally we knew that the major reason that uh, we approached our selections this way was because the librarians felt strongly that usage alone wasn't strong enough to build a diverse collections for our users' needs. And we wanted to test this. So we asked ourselves a few questions coming into it. Uh, number one was how are recommended titles being used compared to the selected high use titles? Did we see a return on investment over time for those recommended titles? Additionally, what publication years of content uh, were selected through the recommendations versus through the high use selections? Were there key topics or disciplines consistently omitted from those high uses that recommended titles maybe met a need for? And then finally, were there selections that have still never been used? And how can those inform collection development more generally at UBC? So next, I will review the data extraction process for this project and how things started to come together. 
Uh, in early 2023, this project was started by two co-op students at the direction of Ellen and myself. First off, uh, you can see Milan took on analyzing Cambridge um, under Ellen's direction, and then following up, uh, Tristan did the same with the Taylor and Francis content. And they began by reviewing uh, the 2018 to 2019 contract years. Uh, both for Cambridge and for TNF, and they matched these with the overall usage from 2019 to 2022 to see how those titles had been used over that three-year period since they had been selected. So once they had dug into those and sort of reported back, we were seeing some trends in the data that we wanted to dig into a little bit more. So in uh, July of 2023, all the way up till October, I wanted to work to expand on this. Um, and so I wanted to sort of expand on what Milan and Tristan had also found by pulling in more selections and also more data to look at this. Um, I ended up working with these selections, both the librarian recommendations and the high use selections for the contract years of 2017, 2018, 2018, 2019, 2019 to 2020, and then finally 2020 to 2021. I didn't use the first year and a half of both of our EBAs as the contract period was a little bit longer than a year, and that didn't match the others. And also, I didn't go further ahead in time as those, um, the following data sets for those were actually run by a different set of librarians, and they were using a slightly different protocol. So again, it didn't quite match the, this set of four. And I worked through our final selection sheets for those years to splice the selections into two tabs for each of the contract years. So one tab was the librarian recommendations, and one was for all of the other selections that were from high use. And from here, I was able to load all of those ISBNs into Gobi and use the system extracted data to create consistent worksheets and metadata for each of those lists. And notations around which campus had made the selection and the contract year were also added. Then I was able to pull the counter usage data for 2017 to 2022 for both providers and load copies of these to those workbooks for each of the contract years. And I only looked at the usage from the first year for each contract through to 2022. Uh, so as the contract years got closer to present, there was less usage being reviewed. Or in other words, I didn't look at the usage of the selections before their contract year that we purchased them in, even though there may have been some usage. With the usage and the metadata in a workbook for each of the contract years, I was able to then apply uh, the VLOOKUP and the match if formulas that we were using to draw the usage into those metadata worksheets. And this was certainly without, not without its difficulties, which I'll touch on in a minute. And one thing to note is that while Counter 5 was released in January 2019, Cambridge had actually retroactively gone back and provided this back through to 2017. But TNF did have that hardline restriction uh, for 2019. And so the data anomalies with Counter were, were certainly present. So as for the overall challenges, there were many, uh, but this slide does illustrate some of the most frustrating ones. Uh, so first, uh, we found that many of the spreadsheets had gone missing over the years or were on personal drives rather than central drives. And so through this exercise, we were able to clean up some of those records related to the EBAs and make sure that there was consistency amongst those. Uh, next were the data, or sorry, the ISBN anomalies. And since we were asking librarians to recommend titles in Gobi, sometimes they would pick the non-publisher platform record, which usually included a different ISBN from the publisher ISBN. And so uh, this certainly was frustrating, uh, but was uh, quite a common occurrence during those e early years of our EBAs. Um, and we didn't really correct them at that point. And so as we've moved forward with our EBA contracts, those uh, have been adjusted and usually part of our workflow to pull out the publisher platform ISBNs as we go. And this obviously added a lot of manual cleanup um, to our workflow, but we were able to do that in Gobi 
and make sure that those ISBNs would match in the usage. And additionally, it was noted that at the time, uh, one of the publishers had been changing their ISBNs as well as their titles for the final books. So sometimes the records in Gobi had an earlier title than was in the usage or even a different ISBN. And so that did sometimes cause some complications. So further to my earlier comment as well, the move from counter four to five did cause some differences in the data. And it caused us mostly to have to use different formulas to merge the data. And this is ultimately why we did have to use a match if formula for some of it. Um, additionally, the TNF platform saw a merger in November 2017, which resulted in one year where there were actually duplicate listings of the titles in the data and those that had to be manually merged before those formulas could be applied. So just sort of another hiccup along the way. Um, additionally, some titles were also found to have turned open access out open access since we selected them, which was really interesting to see. And, and obviously we know about the ebook publishing world, um, but this really did lead us to sort of question whether or not the usage could be trusted overall for painting that sort of full use picture of some of those titles. So we were less concerned about the fact that perhaps we'd paid money and then they'd moved away, but uh, more concerning for, for the data we were looking at around the usage. And then finally at UBC, um, we have restrictions around the use of our institutional install of Tableau. And so it is believed uh, that Tableau probably would have served us better to analyze this data in a more straightforward way, but we didn't have time to uh, sort of allow our library assessment team to build something around that. So next I'll dig into the findings uh, of the different analyses uh, that I was able to pull out of the data that was put together. So here you can see a breakdown of the total selections for both of the EBAs from Taylor and Francis and from Cambridge. And um, sort of these are broken down by those that came from the librarian recommendations as well as those from the high use. And then there's also a total line overall at the top there. And as you can see, the TNF selections are about double to those of Cambridge's EBA. And the pattern of recommendations versus use is slightly different between the two EBAs. And it appears from this data that the librarians were making more recommendations proportionally for the TNF titles over the Cambridge titles, whereas Cambridge was relying more consistently on high use selections. And something that was uniquely of interest to me when I was putting together this analysis was how many titles that had been recommended by the librarians had never actually been used even up until the end of 2022, which was uh, when we capped off bringing in the counter data. And so for both TNF and for Cambridge, uh, we saw this trend where the total amount of titles with the zero use continued to trend down for the first three to four years after that contract year that they were published in. But it does seem to plateau a bit in years four to six, and it would be really good to rerun this data in a couple years where more of these contract years have reached that year six post-purchase to show whether or not that trend is still sort of plateauing or if it continues to go down or even zeros out. And overall, you can see that Cambridge did have fewer zero use titles proportionally, signaling that even though librarians were recommending less Cambridge content, it was content that would eventually get used over time. Next up on this slide, um, I was able to drill down into the full book versus the chapter use uh, for each of the publishers as they provided each option on their platform. And uh, do note that the starting points are different for each contract year as the usage starting point was always the first year of that contract year again. So for Taylor and Francis on um, for this slide alone, you can see that there is roughly even popularity of both the full book and the chapter use, but there was very different ways of getting there from the beginnings of each contract. And it appears from this, these usage lines that the chapter use may be trending more for the future over the full book use, 
Whereas you can see the full book use um, at the start of each of these contracts really came in very high. And similarly with Cambridge, um, the overall chapter and full book use is ultimately at similar points at the end. But again, how it gets there does look different with each year of the selections. And while Cambridge shows a more consistent use of chapters, it does appear to differ from Taylor and Francis in that full book use may be actually trending up more slightly. So just a little bit of a different pattern. So another analysis uh, that was important to us overall was around use thresholds. And so we knew that often our starting point for the lowest number of uses we go down to when we're selecting high use titles is around 25. And in each year, it may be right at that mark or perhaps even a little less. One year we were able to go down uh, to 16 uses in the Taylor and Francis EBA. So it does fluctuate, but for the purposes of this analysis, we picked 25. And these tables show how many of the librarian recommendations from each contract year had over 25 plus usage in each of the usage years, which was signaling whether they would have met that use threshold when selecting them. Um, so if they had not been placed as a librarian recommendation, would they have been purchased as a high use title? So this is the number of them in each of the years that would have hit that point. And as you can see, most of the Taylor and Francis titles would never have been purchased in future years after the librarian recommended them, as they simply wouldn't have qualified as high usage. And that isn't to mean that they weren't being used, but they were clearly serving a smaller user group and just being used less. So they never would have met that threshold. So conversely, though, on the Cambridge side, many of the Cambridge titles did move over that 25 plus mark. And this could mean that Cambridge content overall has high use, or it really could mean that the librarian selections are extremely meaningful and that they sort of save spots in the future contract years to pick up other high use and recommended titles that they otherwise would have taken the spot of. So if uh, they had not been picked up in that year that they were, then they probably would have gotten picked up in another year and sort of taken that spot from another title that could have been picked. Also of interest was comparing the mode of the publication year for the selections to the mode of all of the uses in each of those years. So in this particular table, you'll see the mode broken down by contract year, uh, and then specifically by the librarian recommendations and those selections from the high use. And as you can see, Cambridge was very consistent as the titles selected to purchase in each contract year were most often those of the starting year of that contract. TNF, however, did see a bit more sporadic modes, especially when it came to the titles being selected through high use and um, as mentioned at the outset, we would often try and focus um, on more recent publishing years in the selections, but this was still very interesting to see as it wasn't always the current year that was the most popular. And here you can see the modes for all of the book usage via Cambridge and TNF for each of the years and the usage type. So. TNF didn't have pub years listed um, in some of the counter four reports, which does ca cause some missing data here, of course. Um, but as you can see, so, <clears throat> excuse me, sometimes full book and chapter use saw the same publication year mode, but other times it was very different and sort of all over the place. So overall, uh, this consistently showed that our users were going after newer content. So within the last five years of when we had that contract here. <clears throat> and next, I turned to analyzing the selections in a little bit of a different way, um, because we did know that diversity was important to our librarians, and that this is one thing that they believed a usage only model would not solve. So these numbers roughly count the librarian recommendations that obviously showed EDIA topics in their title from the TNF selections. 
with an understanding that there are likely others in the lists. So as you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, in uh, 2017 to 2018, 107 titles out of the 628 or more uh, were seen to really obviously emphasize those EDIA topics. Um, of those, nine uh, had 25 plus um, use titles, and then five were zero use. So <clears throat> those are the sorts of breakdowns that we went through when we were gathering this. And so these uh, numbers do roughly count the librarian recommendations that were obviously showing EDIA topics in their titles. But of course, there's going to be a, a lot more in those lists if you were to look at the, the book abstracts um, or even digging into the sort of contents and chapters. Now, of course, the themes in the TNF content here, which is uh, on this slide, did center around gender and sexuality topics marginalized communities and voices, non-Western perspectives and studies, anti-colonialism, disability and accessibility studies, as well as historical and present representations. And as you can see, EDIA titles uh, make up a good chunk of each year with some from each reaching those 25 plus thresholds, but only uh, a few having those zero use. And it's anticipated that the 2020, 2021 total of zero use titles, those that 22 there will continue to trend down over time as more use uh, can, can pick up. Um, but overall, this signals that again, the librarian recommendations are hitting this sort of sweet spot of the usage where things are just being used by a smaller community, but they are still very, very relevant. And then similarly, Cambridge saw a decent number of EDIA focused titles amongst the librarian recommendations. <clears throat> One striking difference though, with the Cambridge titles was that so many also already had 25 plus uses. And for a couple of years, none of, none of them had zero use. So this really demonstrated that the EDIA content from Cambridge is clearly coveted by our users. And this trend mirrors the overall number of 25 plus uses that we saw earlier from the overall librarian recommendations for Cambridge. And the themes from this content centralized on um, very gender and women's studies forward themes, as well as sort of research about or from non-Western countries. Um, and it was interesting to see that the EDIA uh, thematic differences between Cambridge and TNF librarian recommendations, which can likely be attributed to, you know, the two publishers simply having different focuses in terms of publishing areas. And finally, I moved to analyzing the zero use recommendations by call number to see where they were coming from most often. So the top five for Taylor and Francis included the social sciences, as you can see there, languages and literature, science, music and books on music, and then tied for number five were medicine and fine arts. And the implications for this information really rests on the subject librarians. So this is crucial to see which subject areas see the least circulation by what they are recommending. It might be that they can move some of their subject areas um, or subclasses to request based only, or it may provide a more qualitative understanding to their disciplines that they didn't have before. And additionally, this can help in conversations between the subject librarians and the librarian running the selections to know whether certain publishers are key to an area. So for example, in music, but that content may not be used on regular cycles. So perhaps it could be even every five years or up to 10 years, but it may be very crucial to collect or one of the only publishers in that field. <clears throat> Similarly, uh, for Cambridge, you can see the top five here. So languages and literature, social sciences, political science, medicine, and then philosophy, psychology, and religion. And again, um, this may spark conversations around whether some areas could use reconsiderations. And so as a wrap up, I will review a couple last conclusions and takeaways. 
So there are a few next steps for us on this project. The first is to explore loading this data into Tableau with our library assessment team. And this would make it more interactive for our subject librarians as well, and just more useful overall. Um, next is to share these findings with our eBooks team, our collections team, and of course the subject librarians across both campuses. We want to focus on the idea that this data can inform collection development, whether you have been the liaison librarian uh, with a subject area for years, or you're just starting out with a new subject area. And additionally, we'd like to compare the usage of the selections with um, other select front list packages, just to see how the EBAs compare to a package. And overall, we do want to prioritize ebook assessment. Um, and this will be an angle that we want to take in the future. And finally, this has helped to inform the records keeping processes of the EBA selection workflows and does really illustrate the need for consistent mechanisms year over year. And so in conclusion, there were a few learnings and takeaways uh, that I want to impart here. So the first one being librarian recommendations matter. So we kind of anticipated this going into this research. And of course, we had that prioritization from our own librarians. But um, I, I want to emphasize, you know, having a mechanism for them to do this does help them stay current in their liaison areas. They support um, finding resources that smaller communities of users want and need, as we saw in the data. And they also help to develop the collection for preservation and breadth for the future. So this is of great importance for UBC as a research intensive university that does partake in preservation initiatives. But I also realize that this may not be um, sort of a sacrifice that every school can take on and that everybody will have their own needs and prioritizations when it comes to this work. And additionally, uh, this kind of work can help to modify other collection development. So sometimes you see trends that you didn't expect, or you don't always want to deliver back to the subject librarians if it's not uh, super positive. So um, I just want to impart that, you know, this, this should be and can be uh, presented in a very positive way. So speaking to the development of the research and teaching needs of your institution, and not as something to fear or something you're losing or may have missed along the way. And finally, a balance is important. So this is something, uh, again, that um, I think we we kind of hypothesized going in, but uh, has definitely been shown. And so even if you do sort of go use-based, even for one year after having this librarian recommendation model, you can certainly fall behind. And um, how you get back uh, after this and, and really prioritizing those selector titles when they're not meeting that high use threshold it becomes a challenge. So it is important not to step away from this workflow once you implement it um, and that use is just as important, but that balance is really needed to build the most diverse collection that you can that you can have out of this. And while this data analysis resulted in over 10 spreadsheets with multiple worksheets uh, within each and many, many, many hours of work, it was still worth it. And uh, this level of analysis might not be for everybody, but if you're curious, please do not hesitate to reach out and I'm happy to share more. So thank you.